one of the harder parts of Christianity to talk about. That uh, if we've walked with the Lord for a while, there are going to be times where we find ourselves angry at God. Maybe that's a disappointment. Maybe that's over the uh, sense of injustice in the world. Someone who's hurt you, yet they seem to get away with it. Maybe it's that mild form of, of anger that kind of rage, comes up in a, like a jealousy. Why are there folks that lead businesses that seem to lack integrity and yet their businesses do just fine? If you're in ministry, why, are there, uh, why does it seem like there's another megachurch pastor falling every week with some sort of moral issue? And yet the congregations, some congregations burst with people and others struggle. So the jealousy comes up. God, why isn't there more justice in the world now? We've seen your power. We've seen your capacity to do miracles. To alter history. To heal the sick. Why is it that one person gets prayed for and they receive a miracle and the other person gets prayed for just as much and there's no miracle? And so we find ourselves in the... Uh, the sulking shelter. And if we're honest, we find ourselves relating to Jonah. We're finishing off our series today in the book of Jonah. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 4. And uh, it's kind of a funny story because it, it ends on a bit of a bit of a tragic note at least from Jonah's perspective. But I think if, we, if our hearts are open to hear it, we'll, we'll find ourselves relating to Jonah a fair amount, perhaps. So, um, so as the story uh, picks up, of course, uh, and we, just to review Jonah a little bit. So Jonah was a prophet. He was, a, he was the, this, this famous kind of reluctant prophet. Maybe even you can call him the pathetic prophet because God told him to go to the city of, do you remember? Nineveh. Nineveh. And Nineveh was from Jerusalem, where Jonah was living, or close to Jerusalem. Nineveh was to the east. But where did Jonah go? Jonah went to the west. As far as he could go, as fast as he could go. And he's, he's, and he's on a boat in the Mediterranean Ocean, sailing for what for him would be the outer western regions of the known world. A great storm comes up. And Jonah knows that storm has to do with him. And the sailors on the boat, um, they draw straws and Jonah draws a short straw and it's clearly revealed it's Jonah. Jonah admits to it. He fesses up. He says, you've got to throw me overboard if you want to be spared from this storm. And the sailors eventually reluctantly agree. And so Jonah is tossed out of the boat in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean. He's sinking. He's certain that he's going to die. And then God intervenes. He sends a great, do you remember the next part? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right, a dag gadol, a great fish. Could it be a whale? Maybe it could have been a whale. Either way, it's a miracle because, yes, it is impossible except for God. The slimy lifeguard swallows up Jonah. Jonah spends a bunch of time and the next thing he knows is he is erped out on dry ground and he is thinking new thoughts about his life and the direction of his life. Maybe you found yourself in those kind of slimy, stinky situations where you go, you know, I think I could do something different now. This time, Jonah responds to God's call to go to Nineveh. And he, and, he, and he arrives in this great city. Now, the thing you need to know about Nineveh, Nineveh was at the time the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. This was one of the, um, 
well, this was the leading empire of the Middle East at the time, and it was Israel's enemy. And we'll talk more about what the Assyrians were known for in a few minutes. But they were a violent people. And God, res- or God tells Jonah to, to deliver this message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Or overturned. The Hebrew word there is hafa. Say that with me. Hafa. Which means turned over or overturned. And a miracle even greater than the fish occurs. And the people of this violent empire, the capital city of this violent empire, repent in sackcloth and ashes. Starting with the king and, and all the way down. Can you imagine in this moment, so I, I, I'm just, just to put it maybe in current events, you know, some obscure prophet shows up in, um, at the Kremlin and says, Vladimir, knock it off. And he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> now that you mention it. And the whole, and, 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 and the army relents. The whole city The whole city repents. It's a greater miracle even than the storm. Greater miracle even than the great fish, the great whale, whatever that was. And Jonah finds himself in the sulking shed. Because Jonah is not happy about it. So let's read Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, starting with chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they, the people of Nineveh, did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. In 40 days you will either be overturned or you will turn over. Either way, God's promises will always, always always be fulfilled. We will find ourselves bowing before God's mercy or bowing before God's might, but either way, there will be justice. And sometimes God allows us to choose which form we'll receive. Chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, or in the Hebrew, greatly wrong. And he became angry. That's our word of the day. Angry. And he prayed to the Lord. Aren't you glad that the Lord hears our angry prayers? He prayed to the Lord and said, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Really? So that was your motivation, Jonah? Because, God, I knew that you are gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. It is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right? For you to be angry? There's our word of the day. And there is our question of the day. So Jonah, he had gone out and he sat in a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter. And he sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. But, the, but at dawn, the next day, the Lord... Or the, the, the Lord provided a leafy plant. There it is. And he made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was greatly happy about the plant. If we're going to watch the Nineveh smoke show, you might as well have VIP seating. Because now that I've given the Lord a little talking to, perhaps he will change his mind. So let's see what happens. Because then the Lord provided the next day a worm which chewed the plant 
so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided the scorching east wind and the sun baked on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, it's that same question again. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is. He said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, Jonah, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people, who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So our word of the day and our question of the day is the question that God asks Jonah twice in this chapter. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? Now, of course, in the context of the, of the passage, it, it sort of implies that the answer is no. God's going to have mercy on who he chooses to have mercy. And Jonah, you don't get to have much say about it. You should be happy about this. You just preached the, the world's most effective sermon, Jonah. You, you speak five words and 120,000 people change their ways. You should be excited about this, shouldn't you? But of course, for Jonah, it's not so simple. And the truth is, it is not so simple for us either. So Jonah wrestled with anger. And so do we. So, so to look at the, that question, the question, is it right to be angry? I want to take a look at it from the other side of uh, what if the answer is sometimes yes? What's the purpose sometimes of anger at God? I want to look at at least, at least two angles. The first one is this. If, if you've never found yourself scandalized by the grace of God, and maybe even a little bit offended at the grace of God, you probably don't understand it yet. You mean to say that God is willing to forgive people who even do really, really bad things if they're willing to turn from them and repent? Really? God is willing to forgive anyone who casts their life before the mercy of God? Anyone? I mean, there's a liability that I might be sharing the new heaven and the new earth with some people I really don't like? <laughs> if, if you ever um, want to kind of get an internet eyeful, Google this phrase. Uh, Assyrian Empire Cruelty. Now this is not to cast shade on, on modern Assyrians. This happened uh, 2,800 years ago. But even in secular history, they record the brutality of the Assyrian Empire. I'm not going to go into great detail other than one, one piece. Now, and it's actually the, 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 the thing that the Assyrians invented that we happen to know the best. Because you see, about 800 years after the Assyrians invented it, Jesus experienced it. Do you ever wonder who invented crucifixion? It was the Assyrians. 
that somehow there were people in that empire, perhaps people even living in Nineveh at the time as, that Jonah is preaching, that had such a sadistic approach to life that they would, they, they would manage to spend whatever mental energy and time there is to figure out what is literally the most painful way a person can die. So crucifixion, uh, there are uh, spikes driven either between somebody's hands or between the, 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 the bones on their wrist. And the, and the sheer brutal genius of crucifixion is that as they're, as they're hanging on a, on a, on a, on a, a cross or, or some sort of a cross beam, is that their legs are actually bent before a spike is driven into their feet. So, for every breath, you, you, you actually have to push against the spike in your feet to be able to draw air. The, the, the brutal reality of crucifixion is that somebody could actually be in that state for many days before they die. It was known as the, uh, well, I mean, you know, you go, you know, you go to the hospital and they talk about your pain scale. I mean, this this is an eleven. The, we we still use the phrase excruciating pain, pain as though being crucified, excruciating. The Assyrians invented that. And a whole bunch of other things equally and even more grotesque. Do you understand why Jonah was in that shelter? What if God's grace and God's love for people his mercy extends even to the, to the degree that somebody like that, if they truly repent, could be forgiven. I, I hope even as you consider that, there's a little pit in your stomach like this. Really? Is God's grace really... That big? That's why I say if, if you don't find yourself at, at times scandalized, maybe even offended by the grace of God, you probably don't understand it yet. That's why we get angry at God sometimes. The other, perhaps good thing that comes out of anger with God is I, I, think, I think our frustration with him sometimes is actually points us to the reality of God himself. Think of it this way, like the, the, the man-made idols of our, of our time, you know, they, they, they kind of function like, like mascots for our values. You know, the mascot for a team is always, is always in favor of the team that they're the mascot for. They're always rooting for you. They're always going to do the thing that you hoped they would do. You know, the understanding of an idol is a little bit like a vending machine. If you just put the right coins in the top, the item that you're hoping for will pop out the bottom. And we often long for God to work like that. If I just say the right prayers, if I just do the right things, if I just, if I do, you know, whatever it is, if I, if I just claim it just right in Jesus' name, it will happen. And I, I'm, not, I'm not here to be a little passionate prayer. But the hard part about the actual God of the Bible is that he is incredibly powerful and at times, from our perspective, unpredictable. 
If you've walked with the Lord for a number of years, you've probably seen those examples of, of, of the, the, the inexplainable. You know, the, the, you've seen examples of God's power. I mean, I've known people that we've prayed for and we see, we see miracles, medical miracles happen. And then you come to another situation and people are praying just as passionately and it doesn't happen. And the healing that you long for doesn't occur. I've seen people in lifelong struggles turn to the Lord and, for example, cases of addiction or things like that. And in a heartbeat, they'll be healed. It's just inexplainable miracles. And there's others. It just doesn't happen. That God can be unpredictable. Our idols are predictable. Human idols are predictable. But the God of the Bible is not a human idol. He's unpredictable. He's powerful. But he doesn't always do what we tell him to do. And so we get angry. If you find yourself angry with God, you find yourself in really good company. You know, about half of the Psalms are Psalms of anger. You see times like people like David who, who served the Lord and, and was seeking God with his whole heart, and yet he also had multiple assassination attempts against his life. And he cries out to God over the injustice. Great leaders like Moses crying out to God for, why do you make me lead these people? <laughs> And even to a certain degree on the lips of Jesus as he is dying on the cross, his final words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you find yourself at times feeling like Jonah in the sulking shed, you are in good company. You know, especially in Western Christianity, we, we really like to turn God into into an idol. We love phrases like God bless America as if God's role was to bless America. Now, I, I hope that God does bless America. There's nothing wrong with saying that phrase, but, but actually saying that phrase in reverse is actually more true. America bless God. The God of the Bible works for no one. He invites us to align our lives and our hearts with his work. Now in the midst of the struggle, a couple words maybe of assurance. Though I, I want to be careful with this because sometimes you know, people in my role, we, we want to explain away sometimes the tension that we feel in our faith. Try to explain away some of, the, some of the mysteries of God. But what, we, we talked about this a little bit in the first week. So the um, book of Jonah is written somewhere around 780 B.C. And uh, the great miracle, of course, is that Jonah comes and he preaches to the city of Nineveh at the center of the Assyrian Empire, and they actually repent. They turn from their violent ways. And yet, in, if, you, if you read the Old Testament, you've got Jonah, then you've got the book of Micah, and then you have the book of, do you remember, Nahum? Nahum is written about 150 years later. As the generation that followed the generation that heard the preaching of Jonah apparently went back to their evil ways, went back to their empire building, and they went back to their violence. They went back to, to the horrific human rights abuses that the nation ended up being known for. And, and Nahum preached against the violence of Nineveh, preached against the violence of the Assyrian Empire, and this time they didn't repent. And 150 years after the preaching of Jonah, the Assyrian Empire and the city of Nineveh was destroyed. 
That's why uh, if you, you can't uh, hop on a plane and fly to Nineveh right now. You can hop on a plane, fly to a city close to Nineveh, and go observe the ruins of Nineveh. But that's all you'll see. So perhaps a reminder as we wrestle with the justice of God and our anger at times over the seeming injustice in the moment that we experience. Just simply the reminder, we don't see the big picture. We don't see the whole story. One way or another, whether in this life or in the life to come, whether on the earth now or, or when Christ returns and sets things right, one day there will be justice. One day. And so sometimes we just have to hang on to that. That God understands us in our anger. I'm so glad he doesn't, he doesn't just cast Jonah off because Jonah is ticked at the Lord. And he doesn't cast you off either. And even as the Lord is rebuking Jonah for, the, for, the, for his actions and his attitude, I hope you hear the compassion in his voice. I want to come back to that, the, the last two verses in, in, the, in the book of Jonah, verses 10 and 11. And can we put them up on the screen? So, but the Lord said to Jonah, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it and make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they, they, they were directionally challenged, though perhaps they were. And also many animals. So, the, the, you know, that, that, that phrase, the right hand from the left, that, that's, a, that's a statement about the, the, basically they, they lack moral sensibility. These are people that don't have a clue about right and wrong. They don't have a clue about right and wrong. They cannot tell the right hand from their left. And so God is looking at this people group that have done horrible things. And, and he doesn't deny the fact that they're violent. But somehow in his heart he sees also their ignorance. Ignorance. They really don't know. So maybe one piece of assurance in there for us, as, especially as we rail against God and we say, God, it just seems so wrong. It seems so wrong. It seems so wrong. Why are you being so kind to them? Why do you give them so many chances? It's to simply remember this. God's grace for them is also God's grace for you. God's grace for them is also God's grace for you. The God of the universe doesn't just look at the, the people that on earth we might think of as, as our enemies with astonishing, scandalous levels of kindness. He also sees you with scandalous levels of kindness. Sometimes we're awfully hard on ourselves. We see our own flaws. We, 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 you know, we, we focus on every bad thing we've done. And, and it is good to be repentant. It is good to do you know, moral assessment of our past so that we can make things right. But the God of the universe looks on us, looks on you through eyes of scandalous grace. 
And maybe that's the, the biggest idea in the book of Jonah. I mean, we, we came for the fish. You know, we, we remember the story because of the fish, right? But the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle in the, in the book of Jonah, and truly the greatest miracle in the universe, is the miracle of God's grace. Oh, what great lengths God will go to redeem lost people. What great lengths God will go to redeem lost people. Do you have any idea how much God loves you? Any idea at all? So I want to lead us in a, in a time of prayer. And um, I, I'm assuming this topic is probably, for many, has kind of stirred some stuff up. There's, there's nothing easy about talking about being angry with God. And so I, I, I'm trying to avoid the temptation to kind of give everything a soft landing and tie things up so everything just feels, just feels good. But what I hope we would do is... is is simultaneously hang on to the tension that we sometimes feel. God, why did this happen to me? Why, did, why do people, sometimes bad, really bad people, seem to get away with stuff? And simultaneously hang on to the mercy and grace of God. Lord, thank you that you love me that much. God, thank you that you love the world that much. And I hope that you will, f that in those places where you experience anger at God, I hope you'll, I hope you'll let him, I hope you'll let him have it. I hope you'll talk to him about it. He wants to hear what you have to say. And he can handle what you have to say. So would you bow your head with me and let's pray together. God, thank you that even in our places of anger, there are so many things in this world that do not make sense. God, thank you in, even in our places of anger that you don't cast us aside. You don't break off the relationship. Thank you that we can pray angry prayers when we need to. And so, Lord, we just we lay some of the ache before you, the pain before you, the things that don't make sense, the scandal of grace, we lay it before you. And Lord, we also thank you that the scandalous grace applies to us as well. Lord, we need your grace. Lord, we need your love. Lord, I want to pray for anybody here today who just, who just finds themselves especially wrestling with those places of anger. Lord, would you just meet them with your mercy today? Thank you that you can handle it when your children come to you with angry prayers. Thank you that you love us and you love the whole world ultimately that much. So Lord, may we turn to you. May we experience the justice of your mercy. And Lord, may we, may we discover afresh just how much you love us pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.